The commission will come to order, and let me first of all say I'm sorry for the lateness. There is a series of votes on the House floor. Uh, we just finished, so other members should be streaming in, and uh, Senator Marco Rubio and the other senators uh, also have a vote right now. So you never plan these things, so I want to thank you for your patience and forbearance. Uh, this has been another dark and difficult year for Chinese rights defenders and democracy activists, and nobody knows that better than our distinguished witnesses uh, at this table who have lived and suffered uh, for their beliefs, for their convictions, and now others in like manner are suffering today uh, in China. Under President Xi Jinping's version of the rule of law, the law is being used to more effectively curb freedom of expression, civil society, religious freedom, the forced abortion policy, and other fundamental rights. Chinese courts have convicted rights activists and lawyers of subversion of power for simply seeking to represent religious groups, petitioners, and democracy activists. <clears throat> China's diverse religious communities, faced with even more restrictions as new regulations and the signification campaign continues, will further politicize religious life and it leads to more repression. In Hong Kong, mainland China, political interference and its abduction of booksellers threatens the rule of law and Hong Kong's promised autonomy, contributing to a growing climate of fear and insecurity. Internationally, China continues to push a relativistic vision and version of human rights, characterizing universal values as Western values that do not apply to Chinese national situation, even though what we espouse here and what others are pushing both within and from without China are all based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to which China and others have acceded to. The next administration faces major challenges in dealing with China. A new approach is needed that learns the lessons of the past and listens to those who have suffered prison and persecution to advance fundamental freedoms in China. The problem is that U.S. diplomacy is stuck with policies that no longer match and maybe never did match Chinese realities. For the past two decades, or a little more than that, U.S. policy was based on the belief that China's growing prosperity would somehow bring political reforms in the rule of law, that trade matriculates into fundamental freedoms. Many of us argued from the beginning, including me, and I'm not the only one, going back to 1994, when President Bill Clinton delinked most favored nation status with human rights, and by saying, doing so, said that profits trump fundamental freedoms and fundamental rights. Uh, and that was the beginning, in my opinion, the pivot, where the Chinese took the measure of the United States and said they care more about money than they do about values. But that's not the case, certainly on this commission, and that is a bipartisan belief that we have. During those times, we focused on integrating China into the international system, ignoring clear evidence that China, under the Communist Party's leadership, would play by its own rules. China has not become a responsible stakeholder in the international system, as predicted. I would note parenthetically that I also chair the Africa Global Health Global Human Rights Committee, frequently travel to Africa and other parts on, of the world on human rights missions. And I can tell you the bad governance model that they promulgate uh, is being accepted by certain autocratic, if not dictatorships in, on those continents. And uh, so they are not acting as a responsible stakeholder. To the contrary, despite decades of remarkable economic growth, Beijing leaders are increasingly dismissive of Western influence and outright hostile to both free societies and democratic capitalism. A strategy of engagement through trade investment and people-to-people -people exchanges has not led to a freer China and remains cold comfort to China's repressed human rights lawyers, religious and ethnic minority groups, journalists, and civil society leaders. The U.S. must recognize that China's internal repression drives its external aggression and develop new policy approaches that intertwine our principles and interests in the pivotal Asia Pacific region. Working with Congress, the next administration should be prepared to bolster U.S. strategic advantages in the Asia Pacific. This will mean improving military readiness, insisting on a freer and fair trade, strengthening relations with regional partners, 
and making more robust commitments to advancing democratic institutions, human rights, and the rule of law. This last point will require the U.S. to push China to embrace greater transparency and a better adherence to universal standards. It will require the next administration to shine a bright light on human rights abuses and level meaningful sanctions in response to those abuses, which I say with great sadness, this administration, the Obama administration, has not done for the last eight years. The U.S. must also find ways to support China's reformers, their dissidents, and its champions of liberty and the rule of law. The Bipartisan Congressional Executive Commission on China, which Senator Rubio and I co-chair, recently issued its 2016 annual report with specific recommendations for ways to pursue human rights and the rule of law within U.S.-China relations. This report is the gold standard of human rights reports on China. I want to publicly commend the CECC staff for their Herculean efforts in producing this important report. It is a huge task, and I appreciate, we appreciate their hard work. The report should be required reading for members of Congress interested in things related to China, journalists writing on China, and for administration officials looking to develop strategies to engage with China. The need for a principled and consistent American leadership is more important than ever as China's growing economic clout and persistent diplomatic efforts have succeeded in dampening global criticism of its escalating repression and failures to adhere to universal standards. We owe a new approach to the great people like Leo Chabot, who continues as a Nobel Peace Prize winner to sit in prison. People like Gao Zhizhang and so many others and the thousands of others suffering as prisoners of conscience. And we owe it to future generations of Americans whose security and prosperity will depend on a U.S.-China relationship that is open and transparent, free of censorship and persecution, based on adherence to universal standards and hopefully increasingly democratic. It is my honor to uh, turn to co-chair Senator Marco. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank all the witnesses gathered here today. This is an impressive group of men and women who have important stories to share about their own personal suffering and that of their family members and associates at the hands of both the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party. Their experiences must not be viewed in isolation, but rather they are representative of the untold number of other Chinese, Tibetans, and Uyghurs who daily face repression at the hands of their own government. Today, I joined our chairman, Representative Smith, in sending a letter to the Chinese ambassador to raise our concern and seek additional information about a spate of detentions involving prominent Chinese human rights advocates, as well as American citizen Sandy Fon Gillis, who's been arbitrarily detained for 21 months now. I submit a copy of that correspondence for the record. Before going any further, I'd also like to take a moment at this hearing, the last CECC hearing of the 114th Congress, to recognize Chairman Smith for his capable and principled leadership of the Commission. He is an unrelenting advocate for human rights and rule of law everywhere in the world, especially in China, and I look forward to continuing to partner with him in the new Congress, because as today's testimony will no doubt make clear, the mandate and the mission of this Commission remains as vital as ever. The Commission, as you certainly, as you just heard a moment ago, recently released the annual report and it painted an undeniably bleak picture regarding the deterioration of human rights and the rule of law in China, with especially grave consequences for civil society, religious believers, human rights lawyers, and labor activists. Since the report's release in October of this year, those abuses have continued apace in the last two months. As the report documents and as new stories from the last several weeks underscore, Beijing has become increasingly brazen in exerting its extra, extra territorial reach this was especially true in the outrageous abductions of the Hong Kong bookseller last year, including Swedish national Gui Minhai, who is still being held by Chinese authorities at an undisclosed location, and now more recently in China's unprecedented intervention in Hong Kong's legal system in the cases surrounding two democratically elected politicians who won seats in the Legislative Council on platforms calling for democratic self-determination for Hong Kong. The ripple effects of this ruling are not fully known yet, as the Hong Kong government has now taken additional steps targeting opposition lawmakers. This is gravely concerning, and something which the Commission and the Congress will be watching closely in the coming year, especially as it relates to the Hong Kong Policy Act. Returning to the focus of today's hearing, we are at a critical juncture in U.S.-China relations, and there is much wisdom to be gleaned 
for the incoming administration from dissident voices. December will mark 15 years since China gained entry into the World Trade Organization. It is past time to take stock of our approach and recognize that despite what proponents at the time believed would happen, China has in fact used the international rules-based system to fuel vast economic growth while further restricting freedom and increasing repression. Quite simply, many of the principles which have undergirded U.S.-China relations during Democrat and Republican administrations alike in recent decades have simply not yielded the desired outcomes. A perennial critique from those who care about human rights issues has been that the U.S. foreign policy apparatus risks get a, ghettoizing human rights concerns, only giving them the prominence they merit during infrequent and often ineffective human rights dialogues, and then relegating these issues to the sidelines and high-level bilateral engagement. The Obama administration struggled to integrate human rights issues at the highest level, sending unmistakable signals early on, as was famously reported during then-Secretary Clinton's inaugural trip to China in 2009, that human rights issues, quote, can't interfere with the global economic crisis the global climate change crisis, and the security crisis, unquote. Words have consequences. Mid-level appointees at the State Department and elsewhere take them to heart. As such, it will be critical during the early days of the new administration for the Secretary and other senior diplomats to put down markers on these issues, which are of central importance not only to the Chinese people, but to U.S. national interests. For as history has shown us, where rule of law fails to take root, where human rights abuses are committed with impunity, where international obligations are violated, the U.S. should not expect to find a responsible global stakeholder. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on this important topic. Today's hearing was scheduled to coincide with the commemoration of Human Rights Day this weekend and also with the sixth anniversary of the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to Chinese dissident and writer Lu Xiaobo, an honor that he has not been able to rightfully claim given that still today he languishes unjustly in prison serving an 11-year sentence handed down for his essays criticizing the Chinese government. The U.S. must commit anew to standing with China's reformers and dissidents, embracing their aspirations, and consistently pressing the Chinese government and its Communist Party to respect basic human rights and uphold the rule of law. It is my hope that this new administration will appoint an ambassador to China that reflects these priorities, not simply someone that's going there to catch up with old friends. And I look forward today to today's testimony and to today's policy recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and just as a, as a note, the Senate is in the midst of a series of votes. I know it's shocking, the Senate is voting today, but so I'm gonna take my second vote and try to get back here as quickly as possible. Thank you, Chairman. I wanna thank the co-chair for his leadership over the last two years and really during the entirety of his, his uh, tenure in the United States Senate on behalf of human rights everywhere, including and especially in China. And next, uh, Congress, God willing, you will serve as chair, uh, and uh, the commission could not be in better hands. You are just an extraordinary leader. I'd like to now yield to uh, Mr. Hofer, uh, Commissioner Hofer. Okay, there we go, sorry about that. Uh, so good to be with uh, all of you. I especially wanna thank our wonderful co-chairman, uh, co-chairman uh, Congressman Smith and Senator Rubio, uh, two people who couldn't be more passionate and more effective at uh, fighting for the value of every single person, uh, no matter where they're at. As I look out in the audience, uh, truly we are among heroes, uh, and I wanna thank you. Uh, you have lived your lives fighting for freedom, fighting for those uh, who are being persecuted, being imprisoned, uh, and we are so grateful that through you, uh, we are able to make sure that their voices are heard, that no one is forgotten, and that no country or leader or person is left unaccountable uh, for unacceptable actions. And so this is appropriate, uh, certainly to look back on uh, what has happened over the last few years, uh, some maybe uh, some successes, but also some things that didn't happen that uh, should have happened. And to take that and to look forward of what can we do next. And it's my commitment along with the co-chairman and other members of this commission uh, to say that uh, this is 
our responsibility. Uh, there is opportunity, I think, uh, in a, a new year uh, and a new administration uh, to make sure that, uh, again, no one is forgotten, no voice is left unheard, uh, and that we can see my hope, my prayer, uh, my commitment is to do everything I can to make sure that we have that kind of accountability, uh, that we're holding other nations accountable, uh, and uh, uh, that we're doing all that we can to say that every person uh, deserves to be treated uh, with respect, uh, with dignity, and with uh, the ability to pursue their dreams, their religion, their passions, uh, according to uh, uh, that freedom uh, that, uh, that is our right. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Co-Chairman Smith. Uh, thank you for your incredible work. And uh, thank you all for being here today. And uh, again, appreciate the work that's been done, but even more so looking forward uh, to um, greater impact that we can have coming into the new year. Thank you, Randy, very much. And thank you for your leadership as well. I'd like to... Um, <clears throat> Invite to the witness table our other three panelists. We have seven extraordinary women and men who have stood up for human rights in China, most of whom have spent considerable time in prison uh, on behalf of their core convictions and, and belief in human rights and, and religious freedom. Uh, but I'd like to now begin introducing them uh, one by one and then uh, uh, invite you to, to, the, to present your testimony. We'll begin with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Penpa, Zering, who is the representative of the Office of Tibet in Washington uh, and a member of the Tibetan Parliament. Uh, during his student days, he served as the general secretary of both the Tibetan Freedom Movement and Nigerian Tibet Friendship Association. Later, he served as general secretary of the Central Executive Committee in Dome. He then worked as executive director of the Tibetan Parliamentary and Research Center in New Delhi before being sworn in as the speaker of the 14th Tibetan Parliament in 2008. During the 15th Tibetan Parliament in exile in 2011, he again uh, held the Speaker's post. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, for being here. We'll then hear from, from Dr. Yan Jianli, who is President of Initiatives for China, Citizen Power for China. Dr. Yang is a scholar and democracy activist internationally recognized for his efforts to promote democracy in China. He has been involved in the pro-democracy movement in China since the 1980s and was forced to flee China in 1989 after the Tiananmen Square massacre in 2002. Dr. Yang returned to China to support the labor movement and was imprisoned by Chinese authorities for alleged espionage and illegal entry. Following his release in 2007, he founded Initiatives for China, a non-government organization that promotes China's peaceful transition to democracy. Well, they will then hear from Mr. Chen Quan Chen, a Chinese legal advocate and extraordinary activist. Mr. Chen is from rural China, China, where he advocated on behalf of people with disabilities and exposed and challenged abuses of population control uh, and, and defended women who were the victims, as well as their children, from forced abortion and forced sterilization. Mr. Chen was imprisoned for his activism for four years Following an additional two years of extrajudicial confinement at his home, <clears throat> Chen Quan Jen escaped in 2012 uh, in a, a escape that still uh, defies uh, imagination how he was able to pull that off, and then came to the United States with his family. In addition to his position as a distinguished visiting fellow in the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies at Catholic U, Mr. Chen is a senior distinguished fellow in human rights at the Witherspoon Institute, and also an advisor to the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice. This commission, parenthetically, uh, had four hearings on his behalf uh, during that crisis, and we're so glad he is free today. We will then hear from Pastor Bob Fu, uh, who was a leader in the 1989 democracy movement in Tiananmen Square, and later became a house church pastor. In 1996, authorities arrested and imprisoned Pastor Fu and his wife for their work. After their release, they escaped to the U.S., and in 2002, he founded China Aid Association. China Aid monitors and reports on religious freedom in China and provides a forum for discussions among experts in religion, law, and human rights. Pastor Fu is frequently interviewed by the media outlets around the world and has been before the European Parliament and the UN and has been a particularly effective advisor to me and others, uh, especially during Chen Quan Chen's crisis, but also on religious freedom. Uh, when Frank Wolf and I made our way on one of many trips uh, to 
China, right before the Olympics in this case, we were in constant contact with, with uh, Bob Fu uh, as to which house pastors we might be able to meet with. So again, I want to thank him for his counsel and insight uh, then. Then we'll hear from Wei Jing Shang, a longtime leader of the opposition against the Chinese government dictatorship. He was sentenced to jail twice for a total of more than 18 years due to his democracy activism, including a groundbreaking and well-publicized essay he wrote in 1978, The Fifth Modernization Democracy. After his exile to the U.S. in 1997, and I remember meeting him in Beijing when he was let out one time, he was such a high-value political prisoner that the Chinese dictatorship thought if they let out one man to get Olympics, to get the Olympics for Beijing, and this wasn't the one that was held later on, this would have been Olympics 2000, they let Chen, uh, uh, Wei Jing Shang out, uh, and then when the Olympics didn't go their way, they rearrested him and tortured him. Uh, he is an incredible, incredible man, president of both the Wei Jing Shang Foundation and the Asia Democracy Alliance, and I remember meeting with him during that short respite when he was out of prison in Beijing, uh, and he told me, and I tell everybody, that I can ever say uh, or meet with, particularly on this commission, that one of his advices to us was that when you kowtow, when you placate and treat with weakness the dictatorship in China, they beat the prisoners more. But when you're predictable and tough and transparent and lay down clearly what you want to accomplish as a US government or a Western power, they then respond and they beat the prisoners less. Well, then hear from Rabia Qadir. Uh, who is a prominent human rights advocate and leader of the Uyghur people. She is the mother of 11 children. She spent six years in a Chinese prison for standing up to the authoritarian Chinese government. Before her arrest in 1999, she was a well-known Uyghur businesswoman. Ms. Kadir has been actively campaigning for human rights in the, uh, for the Uyghur people since her release from prison in 05. She has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize several times. Despite Chinese government efforts to discredit her, Rabia Kadir remains the pro-democracy Uyghur leader and heads the World Uyghur Congress, which represents the collective interests of Uyghurs around the world. We'll then hear from Danielle Wang, who was born in Beijing. Danielle uh, Wang began practicing the exercise of meditation known as Falun Gong in her youth with her father, Wang uh, Zi Wen. In 1998, she moved to America for her studies, and following the year, the Chinese Communist Party began its persecution of the Falun Gong practitioners. This put her father in prison and set her on a path for calling for help in the hopes of rescuing him for the next 17 years. He was released in 2014, but was denied exit from China when Danielle and her husband attempted to bring him to the US in August of 2016. A very, very incredible group of leaders. I'd like to now turn to Mr. Sering uh, to begin uh, the testimony. Thank you, Chairman Chris, uh, Senator Rubio, and Congressman Holtgren for providing me this opportunity. This is my first testimony before commission after assuming the responsibility of the representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Central Tibetan Administration. And I think this testimony comes at a very timely, uh, uh, very timely because it's just before the uh, International Human Rights Day and also when uh, you're going through a transition uh, to a new administration at the helms of uh, your uh, helms of affairs in your country. And following the results of the uh, presidential election, His Holiness the Dalai Lama had returned both to President-elect Donald Trump and uh, Secretary Clinton and has expressed his wish to meet them. And I'm sure the President-elect and Secretary Clinton will meet with His Holiness as American presidents have done in the past. His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan people are very concerned about the well-being of the Nobel laureate, uh, Liu Xiaobao, and demand his immediate release from incarceration. As I present the case of Tibet before you, we Tibetans stand with our Chinese, Uyghur, Falun Gong friends who are represented here, and also our Southern Mongolian friends who are unfortunately not represented here. We all suffer the same fate under the repressive communist government of People's Republic of China. While completely endorsing the findings and recommendations of the 2016 annual report of the uh, Congressional Executive Committee on China, I wish to briefly touch upon the following points. Number one, religious freedom 
having to seek atheist government's approval for recognition of reincarnated lamas is the ultimate political tool to undermine existing Buddhist practices, just as the case of the Chinese appointed Panchen Lama. And even though the present Dalai Lama has not been included in the list of so-called living Buddhas, the communist government wants to be responsible for the reincarnation of the 14th Dalai Lama. And they said, they said it is an important issue concerning sovereignty and security of the nation. There are many cases, but the ongoing destruction of the Larungar, the biggest center of Buddhist uh, learning, not only for Tibetans, but also to scores of Chinese and repatriation of thousands of monks and nuns from the center, forced to pledge never ever to return, is a case in point as to how China views religious freedom in Tibet. And freedom of movement, apart from the enormous restrictions on Tibetans to move from one part of Tibet to another, particularly into and out of Tibet autonomous region, Tibet, Tibetans face tightening control to travel abroad Tibetans who have obtained passports are being recalled, and Tibetans who are already in India to receive Kala Chakra teachings from His Holiness the Dalai Lama in January 2017 have been ordered to return home before the end of December uh, or face consequences. This includes denial of visas to Tibetan Americans to travel to Tibet, and use of counterterrorism as a tool to control Tibetans, and branding allegiance to Dalai Lama as splitters. These are the four things I want to outline. And the diplomatic and political actions that have worked uh, in the past is, number one, presidential meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Number two, appointment and the role of special coordinator for Tibet. Number three, hearings and reports of the commissions. Number four, financial aids. Number five, bills and resolutions. Number six, congressional and state department visits to Tibet and Dharamsala. Suggestions to the new administration in the Congress. Number one, as an integral part of the U.S. policy on China, U.S. should play a pivotal role in highlighting human rights situation in China, Tibet, Uyghur, and Southern Mongolia. Number two, U.S. should advocate for the release of all political prisoners, including Panchen Lama and Liu Xiaobo. Number three, the new administration should implement U.S. Tibet Policy Act 2002, including early appointment of a senior level State Department Special Coordinator for Tibet. Number four, the administration should impress on China the need to establish U.S. consulate in Plaza. Number four, number five, preserve and increase economic, educational, and humanitarian funding for Tibet, including radio broadcasts. Number six, the incoming president should meet with His Holiness Dalai Lama at the earliest opportunity in keeping with presidents. Number seven, the administration should monitor misuse of counterterrorism in Tibet. Number eight, the administration in the Congress should urge the Chinese government to resume dialogue with the representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama without preconditions. Number nine, the administration in the Congress should emphasize to the Chinese leaders the need to teach uh, in Tibetan language. Number 10, the administration in the Congress should raise discriminatory policies of the PRC towards Tibetans in matters relating to religious freedom and freedom of movement. Number 11, the Congress should support and adopt the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Bill to promote access of US officials, journalists, and citizens to Tibet, Uyghur, and other minority nationalities. Number 12, the Congress should organize more bipartisan, bicameral visits to Tibet and Dharamsala. Thank you, Chairman Representative Chris Smith and Co-Chair Senator Marco Rubio for the opportunity. Mr. Thank Speaker, you. thank you so very much for your testimony and for your very specific recommendations, because all of this uh, will be given to the next administration. Of, uh, so thank you. This is a very important uh, set of recommendations you've made. Dr. Yang? Mr. Chairman, I, I want to first thank you for your leadership and uh, your moral courage and strategic vision in speaking out on human rights issues so consistently and persistently, even when it is not always easy or convenient to do so. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. By any standard, America's China policy has been a failure for the past three decades. The primary cause of the failure has been a fundamental misunderstanding of China's strategic objective along with an inability on U.S. part to respond to it with strategic and moral clarity. Regime security is a number one concern for China's Communist Party. 
it wants to maintain a permanent rule in China, replace Western capitalism with a socialism, socialism with the Chinese characteristics, and substitute its so-called civilization for democracy. The Trump administration must take a different approach in dealing with the Chinese regime by returning to American values to focus the foreign policy and by striking directly at the vulnerable spots of the regime to enable a democratic transition. A democratic China will avoid inevitable conflict with the US and ensure a long lasting peace in the region and in the world. I recommend the following specific actions for the next administration. Number one, use the US market as a leverage. Threaten to withdraw China's permanent trade status unless serious improvements are made in the areas of human rights, political reform, and the militarization of the South and East China Seas, and the link continued progress on all three to all future relations, including trade. Deny foreign tax credits to companies that invest in the localities with gross human rights violations, and other similar measures to address the unfairness of one-way free trade that, that is resulting in China's huge trade surplus of three trillion dollars with the resulting loss of millions of American jobs, all of which will not only bring back jobs from China, but allow the US to take the moral high ground. Number two, use Taiwan and Hong Kong as leverage. Modify the Taiwan Relations Act and the six assurances to reflect a full democratic country status <coughs> and affirm its legitimacy by allowing Taiwan to be a normal member of the international community. Support Hong Kong's struggle for universal suffrage by making it a major bilateral issue with China. Number three, use Japan as leverage. Encourage Japan to take the lead in promoting democracy in the Asia Pacific and return it to a normal status of a great power. Number four, use the Chinese regime's lack of legitimacy and a moral standing as leverage. Engage with the democratic forces in China, the Chinese, Tibetans, Uyghurs, Falun Gong practitioners, Christians represented as this panel at a new level by passing the China Democracy Act to ensure all US government agencies are resolute and consistent in advancing a democracy agenda when engaging with China, and by passing a China's Defense of Human Rights and the Civil Society Act, China-specific mechanistic-like legislation that would ban travel and freeze the assets of Chinese human rights abusers, and pass the act to rename the plaza in front of a Chinese embassy after imprisoned Nobel laureate Dr. Liu Xiaobo. Number five, use the UN human rights mechanism as leverage because both the Chinese government and its people regard the UN as a legitimate world governing authority. And the Chinese government has taken UN as the stage on which it seeks to compete with the US to build a bipolar world order in its own way. The Trump administration must strengthen the US leadership role in forming an alliance of democracies to collectively confront China on human rights issues. Thank you. Dr. Yang, thank you very much for your testimony and recommendations. Um, as usual, you've been a great leader. I'd like to now ask, to, ask Mr. Chen Quan Chen uh, to present his okay. testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Greetings to the chair people, to all the human rights congressional representatives. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Hello. In China, people know me as the best lawyer. Despite having no formal training as a lawyer, I did the work of a lawyer, bringing officials to court and asking the party respect China's own constitution and laws. As a result, I endured, endured seven years of kidnappings, house arrest, secret detention, and imprisonment. After I was let, off, uh, let out of prison, my family and I were put under illegal house arrest and conditions even worse than prison, including torture, until I finally escaped. My own experience tells me that when shouldn't hold out any hope in the Communist Party. This is a fascist regime that destroys the <clears throat> essential goodness of humanity. The Communist Party has been persecuting its own people for years. Last year, it began the infamous 709 crackdown, persecuting human rights defenders and lawyers, torturing people and implicating family members by issuing some <clears throat> some attorneys and activists to def in <clears throat> detention have been forced to make confess guilt in the state controlled media and have subsequently been sentenced to per prison. But some, like Li Heping, Li Chunfu, Wang Quanzhang, Wu Gan, Xie Yang, and other attorneys refused to admit guilt, and hence continue to be held illegally. Two weeks ago, Attorney Xie Yang was tortured by prison police, and Attorney Jiang Tianyong had been disappeared. Activists Huang Qi and Liu Feiyue have been taken by public security. Countless netizens have been uh, <clears throat> blacked online and their speech censored. Under party control, the Chinese people have long lived in a state of suffering and fear. It should be clear that communist authoritarian control is the enemy of humanity. We must put a stop to its destruction of humanity's civilized values. On the other hand, America is a great nation that truly stands out in its commitment to universal values. There is simply no way to compare the US and China on this front. Hence, 
American must be a model for human rights and a leader in the global push to democracy. The American system has the strongest immunity against corruption and the greatest capability for correcting its mistakes. Democracy, freedom, and human rights are America's founding principles. After many injurious years of appeasement and uh, self belittling, the time has come for the U.S. to re uh, re re reinvigorate its core values and to protect universal human rights. I would like to make the following uh, recommendations to, re <coughs> to the incoming administration and Congress regarding human rights. Number one, correct the mistaken policy of separating trade from human rights. Human rights are like clean water, clean food, and clean air. They are an ind indispens indispensable part of life and can't be separated from anything we do. The essence of the policy of separating trade and human rights is to focus solely on making money without care to justice or ethics. In addition, the reality is that a country with strong human rights and rule of law is a better business partners for American companies. Number two, in its position as a global leader, the U.S. should ex uh, express a position of leader support for the universal values of freedom, democracy, and human rights. When a dictatorial regime uses force to suppress its people, the U.S. should act dis uh, decisively to stop it. In addition, we should reconsider NATO's function to transform NATO from a hit charged chaos to heroic sword. Three, prevent human rights abusing officials from entering the United States. Investigate and where illegality is found. Freeze the U.S. assets of Communist Party officials. Four, prevent the Communist Party from infiltrating U.S. academia, media, and other institutions. Five, demand that the Chinese Communist Party respect the UN International 
Treaty on Human Rights, changed the policy of speaking with the CCP on issues of human rights behind the closed doors. Otherwise, we will continue the useless <coughs> conversation we have now. Six, ensure reciprocity of visas for journalists and prevent the CCP from use, using visas to punish journalists who expose the crimes of the party. Seven, invest in tools to get past internet, <coughs> internet blocking mechanisms to assist those who seek freedom in getting past the Great Firewall, the Internet Berlin Wall. Establish direct communication with the Chinese people instead of just with the party. Eight, establish international collaborative mechanism to prevent the Chinese Communist Party from persecuting its own people internally and from breaking down international <coughs> procedures internally. Great nations have great responsibility. In Chinese, there is an ancient saying, bring out the best and eliminate the worst under heaven. This should be the principle to follow. As long as we join together, we can banish dictatorships and make the world a better place. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chen, <clears throat> thank you very much thank you. for your eloquent statement. I would note that we've had, I've chaired 61 congressional hearings on human rights in China. One was about you, for, or with you when you spoke Chinese. And this is the first time you have presented your testimony in English. Uh, so I thank you for that. Um, thank and, you. And, and Bob Fu, our next speaker, was the one who translated when you called in from your hospital bed in Beijing uh, and, did, and got you on the phone through some mysterious way I'll never understand. But I'd like to now yield to uh, Pastor Bob Fu uh, for his testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, um, Congressman Hartgren. Uh, for your leadership too. Um, thank you for uh, the co-chair, uh, Senator um, Rubio, for the leadership. And um, Mr. Chairman, uh, your uh, persistency, perseverance, and uh, constant attention on the human rights and um, religious freedom, rule of law uh, globally, uh, including my uh, motherland, China, has, uh, I think, uh, already making a lot of differences and uh, sometimes we have some setbacks but i, I don't think um, uh, ultimately we will see a free and democratic and constitutional china as uh, my other distinguished uh, friends and uh, witnesses have already said uh, we can uh, pretty clearly see that today's uh, china the uh, human rights uh, situation, the situation on religious freedom and rule of, rule of law uh, should be uh, recognized as uh, the worst, perhaps, uh, since uh, the Cultural Revolution. Uh, just to give you two latest illustrations, as uh, my friend um, Chen Guangchong just mentioned, uh, just uh, barely 16 days ago, our uh, friend, um, uh, uh, prominent human rights lawyer, uh, Jiang Tianyun, 
uh, was uh, missing and presumably being kidnapped uh, based on his past experience. And for visiting uh, a family member of another imprisoned human rights lawyer, Xie Yang, and um, Mr. Uh, Zhang Tianying, I remember in 2009 uh, when I organized a rule of law delegation with a group of human rights lawyers uh, to uh, the U.S. Congress, and uh, it is uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, Mr. Wolf uh, actually organized uh, 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 two congressional hearings. I still remembered when we asked, you know, those uh, uh, fellow human rights lawyers and defenders who are willing uh, to really testify uh, for two hearings. One is on uh, the rule of law in China. Uh, one is on the uh, forced abortion and forced sterilization in China. And uh, attorney Zhang Tianyun uh, attended and testified twice. That really uh, takes uh, uh, courage to do that. And today uh, <coughs> is the 16th day, 16th day he's missing. And um, so I hope um, you could really uh, exercise your leadership and continue to push for his freedom. And I want to uh, recognize um, that uh, Mr. Zhang Tianying's wife, uh, Ms. Jin Bianlin, I uh, invited her to be here today really to witness this. And uh, she's here on my back. Um, Ms. Jin Bianlin is here, uh, Zhang Tianying's wife, Jin Bianlin. Um, so uh, she, uh, we just uh, visited the uh, State Department and uh, also uh, the Minority Leader uh, Nancy Pelosi, and uh, we hope that um, that uh, the uh, Mr. Uh, Zhang Tianyun's whereabouts uh, could be uh, at least revealed, if not uh, freed. That um, he is uh, committing nothing uh, wrong, um, but uh, just visiting a fellow uh, members of uh, a human rights lawyer. And another example, it was uh, on November 29th, uh, just uh, barely a week ago, another human rights uh, and the democracy uh, leader, um, Mr. Peng Ming, uh, he was suddenly declared uh, dead uh, by the uh, prison um, authority after he was uh, kidnapped uh, from Burma uh, as an American uh, refugee and permanent resident and uh, was sentenced to life in prison. So in the past uh, 12 years, he has been suffering imprisonment in China. And suddenly, he was declared uh, death, and uh, the government even confiscated his uh, death certificate. And uh, his three children, who are all American citizens, uh, like uh, several of them actually testify uh, and, and uh, met with you, like Lisa Pong. And uh, they were devastated, and they live at uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, they are wanting to uh, visit uh, the Peng Ming's uh, funeral and to bring his uh, ashes back and his belongings. And yet, uh, the day before yesterday, the Chinese embassy and the consulates reject their visa application even to visit uh, their dead uh, father. So these are just uh, latest examples to show that uh, really the uh, situation are becoming uh, uh, very worrisome. I think um, it's time to have a major paradigm shift in the uh, whole approach to world China policy in the next uh, administration. And um, the so-called lead um, on the back uh, or behind or acquired diplomacy uh, is nothing but uh, a real miserable failure. Here are just uh, a few of my recommendations. Um, and besides the recommendations, I really agree with uh, uh, the, the previous uh, speakers on the, I think, to help uh, pass the Global Magnesty Act to hold those human rights, religious freedom abusers and corrupted officials uh, accountable. I think um, and, and another uh, one I agree is uh, to really uh, develop and push down the uh, 21st century Berlin Wall, the Internet Firewall. And um, the uh, other four, I would just uh, very uh, briefly mention that I think um, uh, to, I want to encourage the Trump administration officials and, and the president-elect Trump to really uh, to um, not only um, re raise these uh, human rights abuse cases behind the doors, but really more importantly, to raise them um, uh, publicly. 
And um, I, uh, the secondly, um, I think uh, it's time to use uh, multifaceted uh, approaches on human rights and religious freedom. The so-called uh, annual human rights dialogue is uh, just nothing but a waste of time and taxpayers' money and uh, should be abolished. I think the human rights should be on the center and front on the overall of strategy, no matter it's uh, a business, I mean economic policy, and uh, to strategic dialogue, and this should be on the um, on the front line. The thirdly, uh, I uh, encourage the incoming uh, Trump administration to adopt a concerted, internationally coordinated efforts uh, by working jointly with our allies in Europe and other regions. I think uh, the release of uh, imprisoned. Uh, lawyer Zhang Kai and uh, Pastor Wen Xiaowu were good examples showing a concerted, coordinated efforts uh, globally could produce real fruits. Uh, fourthly and finally, I think to really, um, this is important that the United States should uh, uh, unequivocally condemn the Chinese brutal violation of uh, international laws by overstepping their own the nation's boundaries and to kidnap and detain citizens. I think, um, as Chairman uh, Smith just uh, mentioned in your opening remark, and uh, the uh, dissidents uh, like Jiang Yefei, like uh, Dong Guangping, they were already under UNHCR protection. And the Canadian government already put them on the resettlement list. And yet, the Chinese government and pressure the Thailand government expatriated them and put them uh, uh, paraded on the TV, uh, so-called confessing their crimes. And now we don't know uh, where they're being held and uh, they have not been tried for over uh, a year. And as of course, we all know about this, uh, the treatment of uh, the uh, Hong Kong, uh, the, um, the Causeway, uh, Causeway Bay bookstore owners. And um, I'm so glad that uh, today, uh, one of the managers from that bookstore flew from Hong Kong uh, yesterday to come over uh, to really to tell the stories. He was uh, the only witness, uh, Mr. Uh, Hu Zhiwei. Uh, Mr. Hu Zhiwei, he was uh, he's 75 years old, an author of 120 books. And he witnessed how the bookstore owner, Mr. Li Bo, was kidnapped by Nan the strong um, mafia-like men uh, by the Chinese military, and uh, the also confiscated uh, over 250,000 copies of the books uh, and uh, tr secretly transported back to China and destroyed them into pieces. And, and um, the loss uh, of the monetary value is uh, over 30 million Hong Kong dollars. I hope uh, our uh, you know, congressional leaders could uh, um, shake hands with him, encourage him afterward, and our media friends can uh, continue to interview him. Uh, he is the only witness, and today is his first time he uh, showed uh, himself uh, with courage because he, uh, he was even in Hong Kong. He was being followed by the Chinese special agents. And uh, when he reported to the Hong Kong police, that uh, special agent was... Uh, 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 was taken to the police station. An hour later, the Chinese agents was released, and uh, the Hong Kong police said, "No, we can't deal with the, our higher authority from Beijing." And uh, so that's the situation uh, uh, in China today. So thank you very much uh, for your patience. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Fu, thank you very much. I just want to point out we've been joined by Ranking Member Waltz. Uh, and I think. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership. I uh, do want to note that the selection as, as to the order of the panel is completely arbitrary. This is a panel of extraordinary men and women, uh, heroes, one and all. <clears throat> and, and again, I want to thank you all for, I mean, seven members on a panel is quite large, but <clears throat> you have made the difference and will make a difference going forward. Our next uh, speaker will be, uh, a witness will be Wei Jing Chang. Again, a man who spent 18 years suffering uh, cruelty uh, that is just beyond the pale, and I'd like to yield to him. I think uh, during the Trump uh, administration, uh, the 
trade relationship with China will be a major policy he has. 而迫使中国政府尊重人权，呃，改善中国的、扩大中国的市场，包包括让中国政府遵守法律，这个将成为川普政府的政策的重要的部分。啊、uh, ，to force China to improve its human rights condition and to Yeah, increase its uh, uh, open open its market, and I think it will be very important policy. 我想在这个问题上 ，CECC 将有可能发挥非常重要的作用。I think、uh, in this regard, uh, uh, CECC should、uh, be able could be able to have a very important、uh, function. 为了节省时间，我让我的助手把英文稿念完。So to save time, I will let.、Uh, Uh, the the my English to be read by my assistant. When Donald Trump becomes president of the USA, he's planning to abolish the the TPP and、uh, to become a trade、uh, be to begin a trade war with China in order to save the U.S. economy. Some people say that this is a disaster. I would I would say this is the right way that should have started even earlier. The reality after 16 years will explain my position. Granting China permanent M M、uh, most favored nation status, that is a permanent normal trade relationship, was a huge mistake. It did not promote the development of the U.S. economy, but was a blood transfusion <coughs> from the U.S.A. to the Chinese economy. It gave China the opportunity to engage in trade war with the United States. The reasons are as follows: the so-called free trade refers to a unified law based on domestic market, thus allowed free trade. Such a free trade can be carried out normally between countries with a similar legal system. There cannot be normal free trade between countries with completely different legal systems. For example, after trade with China liberated. There were two main problems. One was cheap labor. One was its uncertain laws that always change. Since Chinese law does not guarantee human right, it is able to keep labor price at a very low level. This has led to the re relocation of the U.S. companies to foreign countries, while also allow Chinese goods enter the U.S. market with low prices, resulting in unfair competition. It is an important cause of unemployment in the United States. China's precarious legal system creates serious non-tariff barriers. Any local government can develop their own laws and regulations without the need to implement the signed treaties and agreements between the Chinese central government and the foreign countries. So they can actually close their target to the import market. Coupled with the manipulation of the currency by the Chinese central government, those actions increase the exports and create the huge trade surpluses for China. This is an important reason causing the economic recession in the USA. Some people would say, for the USA, fighting a trade war with China will end in defeat, at least a loss-loss result. I think such statements are to confuse the U.S. policymakers. I think the U.S.A. will win this trade war, while China can only succumb to rules developed by the United States. Otherwise, it will accelerate the collapse of the Chinese Communist regime. My reasons are as follows: First, the, for the majority of the goods are in the buyer's market. The United States hold the market. Thus, it has a power to develop rules instead of forcing itself to comply with that so-called global free trade rules that cannot be enforced. The United States can formulate its own tra free trade, fair trade laws, fair trade rules to replace the invalid so-called free trade rules. Second, the Chinese domestic market is narrow and cannot afford the disaster of losing the U.S. market. So China can only compromise on the rules, thus to protect the parts of the market share. Third, in the past, due to overexpansion of export production of shabby goods, 
the quality of Chinese enterprises is very poor. In order to adapt to a fair market in the competition, Chinese companies must quickly upgrade. Therefore, there will be great demand for the technology and service from the U.S. to open up the import market in the U.S. This will help expand the U.S. exports and reduce its trade deficit with China. Fourth, after improving human rights in China, the income of Chinese working class will increase. Therefore, the domestic consumer market will expand. This expansion would benefit the U.S. exporters after fair trade, therefore reducing the U.S. trade deficit and uh, even eliminating it. So I think that the U.S. will win the trade war and in the long run will also be beneficial to the economic normalization in China. China must accept and uh, should accept it. Thank you. Mr. Wei, thank you so very much for your leadership and for your testimony today, recommendations. I'd like to now yield to uh, Ms. Mrs. Rabia Kadir. Thank you, Kirsten Smith, Marco Rabia, John Aplare, Yugo Mushu, Kualatun Utsh, Orlash to Allahuchun, and Night Rahmakitman, and Chakal Allahuchun. Night Bachel or Lastrolde. Chairman uh, Chris Smith and uh, co chairman Marco Rubio and uh, respective uh, respected members of the commission, I would like to thank you for uh, holding this uh, timely and important hearing and thank you for inviting me to testify. And I also thank all the attendees. The people who attend. So I'm trying to learn English so I can not read my statement. So I prepared a statement. So I would like to ask my assistant to read my written statement. So now I'm reading Ms. Kadir's statement. Since my release from a Chinese prison in 2005, I have reported to the Commission the continuing human rights violation targeting the Uyghur people. As the Commission has noted in its annual reports, political freedoms in East Turkestan are among the most limited in China. The right to association and assembly is prohibited and freedom of speech is punished severely, as the case of imprisoned Uyghur academic Ilham Tohti illustrates. Economic discrimination, erosion of language rights, and religious restrictions add to the already depressing condition of Uyghur human rights. President Xi Jinping has attempted to codify these violations in a series of repressive laws, such as the ones on counter-terror and cyber security. Implementation, implementation measures of the counter-terror law at the regional level in East Turkestan is clear indicator of who China intends to target with these draconian measures. Nevertheless, China believes it should go further with its repression. Arbitrary detention, forced disappearances, and extrajudicial killings continue. Recent media reports indicate the Chinese government has implemented a policy to confiscate passports in East Turkestan to limit the international movement of Uyghurs. This is the formalization of a policy that Uyghur human rights groups have documented since 2006. Islam is a cornerstone of the Uyghur identity. China has adopted a series of religious laws at the national and regional level that curb Uyghur rights to freedom of worship. Private religious education has been targeted for several, several years under these measures However, this year, Chinese authorities adopted rules to report parents who encourage their children to undertake religious activities. During the George Bush and Obama administrations, my colleagues and I have worked hard to bring Uyghur issues to the attention of the US political community. Our organizations regularly brief State Department officials and legislators at the US Congress. We have managed to mainstream the Uyghur issue into 
U.S. government reporting on human rights. China's heavy-handed policies toward Uyghurs are creating instability and desperation among the Uyghur people. These policies have become self-fulfilling some, uh, in some respects, as some Uyghurs have become radicalized in their efforts to oppose Chinese oppression. The United States should be concerned about these developments as it is in the nation's interest to support the democratic aspirations of the overwhelming majority of the Uyghurs. Stability in East Turkestan, China, and the Central, Central and East Asian regions offers the opportunity to spread American values such as freedom and human rights. The administration of President-elect Donald Trump should continue support for Uyghur struggle for human rights and democracy and set up public concern over rights conditions in East Turkestan with Chinese officials. Any sign that the United States is ready to relinquish its com commitment to raising human rights concerns in favor of achieving policy gains elsewhere will be a victory for Chinese regime. Furthermore, the incoming administration should exercise extreme skepticism regarding China's narrative that increased militarization and securitization in East Turkestan are justified in fighting radical Islam. The repression that accompanies security measures enables China to keep firm control of the region and suppress legitimate Uyghur claims for greater political, economic, social, and cultural freedoms. The Trump administration should understand the situation in East Turkestan is similar to, in similar terms to the Tibet. It is a struggle for cultural survivor, survival in the face of formidable assimilative actions by Chinese state. Let us be clear, pressure works. My presence here today is testament to the success of pressurizing Chinese officials. My colleagues and I will continue to put forward the Uyghur case to the international community. It is the responsibility of concerned governments to take this case directly to China and urge reform. The Uyghur people greatly appreciate the United States support of our plight. However, we ask the incoming administration to publicly raise the Uyghur issue with China. In conclusion, I offer these recommendations to the Trump administration. First, prioritize Uyghur issues, especially during the human rights dialogue and strategic and economic dialogue with China. Urge China to allow foreign diplomats and journalists unrestricted, ac unrestricted access to East Turkestan and Tibet to independently document the conditions in the regions. Call on China to free Ilham Tohti in Liu Xiaobo and all uh, Uyghur, Chinese, and Tibetan political prisoners. Ask China to change its repressive policies, which is root cause of all bloody incidents in the Uyghur region. Meet with Uyghur, Chinese, and Tibetan leaders and human rights activists at the White House. Create a special coordinator office at the State Department for the Uyghurs. Finally, ask the Chinese government to allow my children to leave China. Thank you. Thank you <clears throat> so very much, uh, Ms. Kadir. I'd like to now go to our, our final uh, and thank her for being here. Sio uh, uh, Dang Wang, uh, thank you for speaking out so faithfully on behalf of your dad especially. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank the Honorable Representative Smith and the Senator Rubio and other honorable members of the commission for having me as part of this important hearing. I am the daughter of Zhi Wen Wang, a loving father and kind spirit who has endured the persecution of Falun Dafa since it st started in July 20th, 1999. My husband and I returned from China in August of this year, empty-handed, 
shocked and heartbroken after experiencing the persecution firsthand as U.S. citizens. My story is one of the millions, but I hope it will shed some light on why the U.S. government's continued role is so critical in ending this atrocity. <coughs> in 17 years, there has never been a moment of relief from constant worry about my father's safety. He was arrested and sentenced in December of 1999 because he practiced Falun Dafa. Over the next 15 years, he suffered tremendously, lost his teeth and had his collarbone broken, and even suffered a stroke in prison one month before his release. Then he was sent to a brainwashing camp in a final attempt to break his spirit in October of 2014. When he made it back home, he was subject to surveillance by police, video cameras, and neighborhood watch. Even today, he has four agents outside his front door 24-7. After my father received his passport in January 2016, my husband and I prepared his immigration and traveled to China in July. This should have been a straightforward trip, but what we encountered was just a small taste of the persecution my father had endured for 17 years. We were followed by the undercover agent and harassed by police. They tried to intimidate us and get under our skin. They taunted us and abused their power. And ultimately, they slammed the door in our face as we attempted to take the last step to freedom. We experienced firsthand the discrimination and ingested Falun Dafa practitioners face every day. Regardless of what the Chinese law states, practitioners are treated as criminals purely for their existence. The night before our flight home, a group of 30 police and agents showed up at our face in Guangzhou, trying to force their way in. They shouted in my face and tried to scare us. Although they, relently, they relented eventually, they stationed spies outside our place to monitor us. We had no choice but to continue on with no one to turn to and no one to protect us. We left the next morning and drove an hour and a half south of Guangzhou to the city of Dongguan, only to be greeted by spies waiting for us at the ferry terminal. In the end, we couldn't even make it through customs. They canceled his passport by cutting it. To think that the years of struggle, sleepless nights, and thousands of miles traveled all ended with a pair of scissors is unbelievable. It is still hard for me to bear that I had to leave my father behind in China to face this cruel environment alone. If my father and I didn't practice Falun Dafa, I may have broken down completely right there. We know that not all in China are in support of this persecu persecution. It is a former Chinese Communist Party leader, Jiang Zemin, behind it. Zheng Qinghong, Jiang Zemin's right hand, is also in power in the South China and played an important role in denying my father's departure to America. In addition, the Chinese regime continues its efforts to spread the persecution abroad via propaganda, misinformation, and infiltration. I ask that the new administration and all officials interacting with their Chinese counterparts to let no opportunity pass by without pushing them on the persecution of Falun Dafa and the monstrous practice of organ harvesting. It is crucial that the United States remain true to the role of human rights champion in the world and bring human rights to the center stage in dealing with China. And finally, I urgently request that the new administration, Department of State, Congress, and all relevant departments help me bring my father home for medical attention so we can finally have our happy ending and a new beginning. I want to conclude with my dad's thanks. He said he would like to thank the U.S. government. It actually put his heart at ease when he was in jail because he knew that I was studying in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you <clears throat> so very much for your testimony. And the love of a daughter for her father is just truly inspiring. I, uh, just a couple of things I'll mention and ask a few questions and yield to my good friend, Mr. Waltz. <clears throat> Pastor Fu, you mentioned um, uh, the case of, of gone missing of uh, Jiang Tianyong. Um, for the record, and I would ask you to have his consent that we include this in the record, um, Marco Rubio and I sent a letter to the ambassador of China to the United States on December 7th 
uh, expressing our deepest concern regarding the recent disappearances of three Chinese citizens, uh, Jian uh, Liu Fei Yu and Huang Qi, uh, and we're hoping for an answer, and we will follow it up with the embassy to try to get to the bottom of it uh, and to advocate for them, but thank you for bringing attention. You did make the point, uh, Pastor Fu, that the human rights abuse situation uh, is the worst in China since the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the best kept secret in Washington uh, and in capitals all around the world as we continue what Chen Quanjian said in his testimony is, a, is an attitude of appeasement uh, towards China that manifests itself all over the United Nations, among nations, um, and certainly in capitals around the world, uh, including Washington. So I want to thank you for, you know, being bold enough to say exactly, you know, we, we perhaps had naive misconceptions about the Chinese dictatorship under Xi Jinping, uh, but as our report this year clearly chronicles, uh, when you look at uh, all of the changes, um, the new laws, draft laws and the like that have gone into effect, whether it be on cybersecurity, whether it be on NGOs, uh, and the tightening of the noose around NGOs, which um, is really an appalling harbinger of a, of a crackdown. Uh, what is happening with regards to religion of all kinds, including the officially recognized churches like the Patriotic or Three Self uh, movement, which uh, are being increasingly crushed. The underground is already crushed. Uh, it's time for a significant reappraisal, which you all have helped to provide to the Commission which we will convey to policymakers and also enlighten ourselves. Uh, there are things that could be done immediately by president-elect when he becomes president. It was not done during President Obama. On visas, uh, I wrote the law in the year 2000, the Admiral Nance Meg Donovan International uh, Foreign Relations Act of 2000, which is permanent law that says that anybody who is complicit with the barbaric one child now maybe two-child per couple policy, but the enforcement mechanisms of coercion remain unabated, uh, are, can be precluded uh, from issuance of a visa by the United States. It is reason for denial. It has not been implemented uh, in the 16 years that it has been in effect uh, since 2000. Uh, the Global Magnitsky Act is en route to becoming law. It's passed as part of the NDAA. Uh, it's in a very good form, I believe and it could be immediately applicable uh, to Chinese torturers and, and, and violators of human rights, and our admonition to the administration when that is signed uh, would be to start chronicling the names, uh, produce lists of human rights abusers, and then hold them to account uh, in a visa denial as, as one modest but meaningful way of doing that. Uh, so we will be pushing that, so thank you for raising uh, those issues uh, as well. I. Um, you know, um, Mr. Speaker, you mentioned if, did you get back, um, to, um, did you leave? Oh, I'm sorry, I should <laughs> put the glasses up. Um, you know, the, the worsening of, of the mistreatment of the mistreatment of a Tibetan Buddhist, the, the New York Times article, uh, China takes a chainsaw to a center of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, talking about what has gone on in the wrong gar, uh, you might want to speak to that, because I think that's a, a highly visible manifestation <clears throat> of the hatred with which the dictatorship holds for faith-filled believers, including Tibetan Buddhists, Uyghurs, Falun Gong, Christians. Uh, I mean, it is a, um, it is, you know, it's one thing to profess to be an atheist. You have every right to be an atheist, but you have absolutely no right, uh, and certainly international law is clear on this, to so aggressively suppress, torture, and, and hurt those who believe uh, in God or in a in a spiritual uh, a practice like Falun Gong. So if you might want to speak to that, uh, if you would, and um, any of you who would like to speak to the visa ban um, and, and the fact that we it should be teed up right now for Trump, <coughs> President Trump, uh, to say we're going to be serious about denying visas to those nation, uh, to those individuals who commit these atrocities. It's a very, and also CPC on religious issues, China has been on the CPC list on a law that was written by Congressman Frank Wolf, International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, uh, and Bush didn't do much. Obama has done nothing with regards to sanctioning. As you know, there are prescribed in the 
International Religious Freedom Act, some 18 specific actionable items, the least of which is a demarche, but then there's some very serious ones dealing with trade, security matters, uh, uh, sharing, uh, you know, like cultural exchanges and scientific exchanges that a serious administration could apply to say, we're not kidding. You've got to let the dissidents go. You've got to end the torture. We had a hearing in this room just recently in which we talked a lot about the torture chair. Uh, again, another one of the best kept secrets in Washington that that is routinely uh, deployed against dissidents uh, to try to break them. So, uh, Mr. Speaker and others, if you want to speak, and then I'll yield to Mr. Waltz, and then I go to uh, Randy Holtgreen. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the Larunga, the, in, the ongoing destruction of residences uh, of monks and nuns in Larungar is a very serious uh, uh, problem that's facing Tibetan Buddhism today. Larungar, uh, some estimate uh, that there are about 20,000 monks and nuns, uh, but nobody has the exact number, but I think it's beyond 10,000, which makes it the largest center of Buddhist learning uh, in the world. And uh, Larunga also faced the same fate in early 2000s uh, when some part of it was destroyed by the Chinese government. And then uh, people uh, did uh, started coming back. In fact, if the Chinese government wanted to destroy it, then why did they allow settlement of monks and nuns in the first place? Um, so this, this has resulted in the present problem. Now it is Larunga, Larunga, the case of Larungar uh, could be a precursor uh, to uh, many of things that could come. If it is not condemned and stopped, uh, then I'm, I'm sure the Chinese government will take this matter to other monasteries. There they are already indications that Yergar, which is also a uh, monastery linked to Yar Yar uh, Larungar uh, may also face the same fate. Uh, in the rest of Tibet, particularly in Tibet Autonomous Region, the restriction of monks and nuns, nuns have come down. Those days when uh, Tibet was free and independent, we used to have 7,700 monks, 5,500, 3,300 5, 3, in the three big monasteries in Lhasa and monks and nuns could come from different parts of the, uh, Tibet to learn in the capital Lhasa and then go back to their respective regions to teach, preach. Uh, and they, they have now brought the numbers down to 500 and still less in those big monasteries. So Larungar is outside Tibet aut Autonomous Region and uh, the learning of Buddhism has increased over the years, not just by the Tibetans coming from different parts of Tibet, but also a lot of Han Chinese who have interest in studying Buddhism. In fact, Larungar is supposed to have a large number of Han Chinese and they are, they are also becoming victims of uh, the destruction that is taking place uh, inside uh, uh, Tibet. Um, so that is but this one example can, uh, you know, exemplify how Chinese government views religious freedom inside Tibet. And we have been appealing the Central Tibetan Administration in Dharamsala. You must have seen videos of monks and nuns being forced to go back and asked to sign. They were even dancing. They were, they were forced to dance and sing praises of the Communist Party after they go back to their respective regions. So this, you know, certain things which are unimaginable are happening, and we hope for uh, the, the U.S. administration, the new administration, this is still ongoing, so we hope the new administration will definitely pay attention to this and bring it to the notice of the Chinese authorities that this is not acceptable to the, China, to the U.S. government. And uh, I think uh, the Congress should also adopt resolutions, uh, you know, to condemn these kind of actions by the Chinese government. Yeah, uh, the, uh, I'm thrilled. I think the, every member of the human rights community is thrilled that um, global Magnitsky bill actually was passed in the House as part of uh, um, uh, National Defense Author uh, Authorization Act. And uh, we cannot wait uh, to see it to be signed by president into law. After that become law, we will work closely with um, 
you know, CECC and other congressional organization committees and the State Department and White House with the list of those we think we should uh, ban their travel to U.S. Um, I think this is uh, just the beginning of the paradigm shift, as my uh, friend and the colleague uh, Bob Fu just uh, said, paradigm uh, shift. So I think I have been advocating, uh, this is the second time for me to, to <coughs> speak about it uh, at a congressional hearing, is a China Democracy Act. Uh, that's the act um, that will uh, state uh, expressly that advancing human rights in China is in the national interest of this country and uh, regulate every federal agencies to promote human rights in China while engaging with China. And also requires a presidential report to the Congress about the progress. And the parallel uh, example would be, you know, recently because of a uh, Taiwan President uh, Tsai Ing-wen's call with uh, um, President-elect uh, Donald Trump. So, the, you know, this Taiwan has been um, uh, on the headlines. But 30, um, 37 years back in Washington, everybody found the Taiwan issue is inconvenient, just as nowadays. A lot of people, present prime ministers everywhere, funding uh, human rights issues in convenient. So they don't want to do it. As a policy, they can, tr they can change when very sit situational. When the situation is not good, they want to change. But that time, you know, the major mentality among the policymakers here 37 years ago to abandon Taiwan altogether, because Taiwan issue has had become very inconvenient, but it, a few congressional members insist that we have to defend Taiwan. We have to pass a law to regulate the president uh, uh, of the United States. Every one of them have to uh, take the responsibility as a duty of law to defend Taiwan. So 37 years passed, then we look back, this act actually worked very well for the long-term interest of this country. But that time, everybody found it inconvenient. This is just a, you know, a parallel to the human rights situation here. And the president may find it inconvenient, but we need a law. We need a China Democracy Act to be passed so that you know, advancing human rights in China would become a duty of law for every president and for every federal agencies in this country. Thank you. Well, Dr. Yan, <clears throat> I would look forward to working with you on that yeah. <clears throat> legislation we've yeah. talked before. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think your point about U.S. policy failures, uh, we need a different approach. Uh, U.S. policy failures need not be forever. Yeah. It's time to change. And um, yes, Wei, Mr. Wei. Uh, I want to say that CECC should be in the 对中国的贸易战中发挥很重要的作用。I want to say CECC should play important role in the future trade war with China. No, that,在对中国的贸易战中,人权和宗教权利等等是很好的理由。During this trade war, human rights and the religious rights is a very good um, reason. 我想CECC应该推动在将来对中国的贸易战中 把人权作为一个重要的目标。CECC should really put the human rights as a very important uh, target during the future trade war. 一方面它可以作为一个理由,另一方面呢,推动中国改善人权也有利于美国扩大在中国的市场。One side it was important to improve human rights, the other side is to improve Human rights would be beneficial to open the Chinese market to the U.S. companies. I want to emphasize that the CECC law actually includes in the trade trade. Uh, as a matter of fact, I want to remind that back 16 years ago, when there was a pass of uh, this uh, uh, act about the a permanent normal trade relationship, and uh, it's really the condition to include to establish CECC was really with the prospect to 
uh, terminate uh, this trade relation, favorable trade relationship when Chinese human rights conditions are really bad. I think I should tell the team to raise this question, that is, we can use CCC this law to promote China's trade relations and to raise China's human rights. So we really should remind uh, uh, the uh, uh, Donald Trump's team uh, that uh, yes, uh, the CECC could be used uh, to uh, to de to use for this trade war, but also meanwhile to improve human rights condition in China. I think CECC should be a very important tool. So I hope C I think CECC should become a very important tool for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wei. Uh, Pastor Fu, and then Rabia Kadir. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to um, go further a little bit um, from what uh, Dr. Yang Jianli just said. Um, we are so yeah, happy to see the passage of the Global Magnetic Act as you have been leading with your colleagues. I think uh, after this passage, we also uh, you know, need to encourage our allies and uh, regional partners uh, to use uh, you know, your influence through the interparliamental mechanism to encourage other like-minded parliaments uh, or inter, you know, other, uh, like a European parliament and uh, to pass the similar measure so that uh, those human rights, uh, religious freedom, uh, rule of law, uh, uh, corrupted abusers, uh, cannot find any safe sanctuary or haven uh, this, uh, you know, in any part of the uh, free world. So we have been working uh, with the, our partners in Taiwan. I think uh, even the Taiwan parliament had uh, a great momentum with uh, bipartisan, actually tripartisan now, uh, support to uh, make this happen. I, and, uh, and also I want to illustrate uh, the, another uh, worrying sign about religious freedom. Uh, as you know that uh, Earlier this year, the Chinese uh, Communist regime just uh, made a proposal, proposed a new regulation on religious affairs. Uh, and according to this new regulation, and um, those who were found uh, so-called illegally organized religious uh, meetings or underground uh, trainings, like uh, my wife and I did in uh, 20 years ago, we, you know, at that time we received uh, two months. Uh, imprisonment, um, but according to the newly uh, uh, promo proposed regulation, if it's uh, passed, uh, those uh, leaders could be subject to uh, up to 33 equivalent, 33,000 U.S. dollars equivalent fine, and uh, of course, uh, f uh, uh, point for um, even uh, criminal prosecution, and uh, those uh, who, um, including those who uh, attend uh, overseas religious training or, you know, kind of a, a, a conference um, in uh, overseas um, are liable uh, to be punished this way. And we just uh, finished a, a training conference on a kind of a, a biblical worldview on law and government in Hong Kong with the 400 Christian leaders from mainland China there. This is the first time I found out the Chinese uh, security agents even went to our conference and uh, warn the conference, uh, uh, some of our Hong Kong partners, uh, which speaker should be allowed to speak. And uh, the two uh, organizers in Hong Kong were violently beaten up uh, when they returned to China a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so you can see the aggressiveness. I think uh, it is a time mm -hmm. to have a new paradigm uh, to handle and deal with uh, this kind of uh, you know, worsening situation. Ms. Kadir. So the, uh, I would like to get get closer, get comments closer. about the uh, religious destruction in, in Uyghur region. It's very similar to what's happening in Tibet. <laughs> there is now new regulations introduced by the Chinese authorities. So according to these new regulations, the religious uh, uh, worship outside the government designated areas would be considered as the illegal religious activities. 
Adet de o halkı hem Müslüman Uygurlar özünün üyüde bir namaz oku, ibadet kıladı. Ama o kanunsuz oldu. So according to Uygur tradition, so according to our religion, we can uh, worship at home, so we can pray at home. So uh, according to this new regulations, the wor uh, worshiping at home pri in private will be considered as uh, illegal religious activities. And be punished by the government. Eğer boğunu olağanın küçük ballarını bir başlangıç mektep okuatı, orta mektep okuatkan ballarını künce sakçı mektep sakçıları sorak kılıp atananlığını kılıp yedirdiler. And also now Chinese authorities encourage the children to report about their parents' activities at home. And every week the elementary, even elementary school children are being uh, questioned by uh, authorities what their parents are, have been doing at home, what their parents whether they are worshipping at home. And balları dadam keşke namaz okuyordu yani ki şu gün şuram tutup ketkendikin o ballarını veyri veyran bulu atkan aşına So there are many families who are destroyed by this uh, you know uh, reporting because the children uh, told the uh, school authorities that their parents worshipped at home so then their parents have been arrested by the Chinese authorities. Ben de ulağanın ballarımı mektepten kovulup çıkırlı atıp onun dikim o sakallı ayalla and the same thing, for example, happened in uh, Tibet, also happened in East Turkestan. The imams of the uh, mosques have been forced to talk to the streets and dance uh, for, and sing uh, praising the C Communist Party. And the Unus of the Medinian in Klavadek, Hem Uyur Oyalarne, Herkun Mahal Malad Ochk Tizildrup, Erlevlan, Gung Sandan Womsa, Halkomite, the Nashin, it was what Dark and Ethigan. It's actually the uh, uh, cultural revolution is uh, came uh, again to, to came back to East Turkestan, so women and men all uh, forced to talk to the streets and sing songs praising the Communist Party and the Chinese government. If anybody refused to take part in this uh, actions will be punished or fired from their workplaces. And the Muslim that didn't pay the nut turban, the Kol Relish, Unda Kol Relish to work up. Hemo Uyghur Namaz of Hoyt, Putin Uyghur Siasi Makos of Turmuj Kipchim. So there are thousands of people uh, who are in uh, prison now in Chinese prison, suffering in Chinese prison. All of them have been. Uh, arrested, detained because of this, you know, uh, so-called illegal religious activities. Thank you. Ching Guang Ching. Hey, uh, 主席先生好。我想提这样两个问题。第一个问题就是我们在奥巴马离开白宫之前，给他一个机会，要求他打电话问问习近平、张天勇到底在哪里。Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have two questions. One is, before Obama leaves office, we should press him to call Mr. Xi Jinping about where about uh, Mr., uh, the attorney lawyer disappear. 对，不要一谈到不要一谈到人权问题、维权人士的问题，奥巴马就躲着走，是吧？马云来，他在白宫见面，那么这些年来没见他跟哪个维权人士走得近一点，那这说明他跟人权走得很远，他并不支持美国的立国治本这个价值。And from the performance of the president uh, during his uh, eight years in office, almost, we, we, we see that he never met any uh, democracy uh, uh, activists and uh, dissident from China, but actually he spared his very valuable time to meet with Jack Ma, the billionaire of, um, of, of the Chinese. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wonder that uh, why the president just um, uh, forgotten his um, uh, duty to preserve the funding principle of the United States as a human rights uh, protector and defender. I hope that the American president can continue to defend the And I hope that uh, the new Trump administration will uh, adopt a, uh, a corner um, uh, agenda uh, to end the um, uh, authoritarian regime uh, with the help of the Chinese people there. In the United States, I think that before uh, Chinese human rights improve, that I don't think uh, America has uh, any um, uh, other choices. 
Thank you. Mr. Chen, on that question, uh, um, uh -huh. it was part rhetorical, but I think it deserves at least some focus. Um, in not meeting with the dissidents, and we have asked the president to meet both in Beijing, when he travels, had traveled there, and in the White House uh, with dissidents. When Bush went to the Olympics, um, we asked him to meet with dissidents uh, like Rabia Qadir and others, and he did. Way well, you'll remember that, um, and he he spent a considerable amount of time before setting foot uh, into Beijing, uh, getting insights from the people who had suffered. The one that has troubled me the most is that after we had our five daughters hearing, uh, we had five precious daughters of dissidents who are today still languishing in prison, including the daughter of Gao Zhejiang, uh, who appealed to the president. And each of the five said, Mr. President, you have two daughters. You will understand. We want to meet with you and ask that you raise our father's cases by name with the president of China. We sent over that request. They made it themselves. The Washington Post did a, an outstanding uh, uh, article on it by the editorial, chief of the editorial, uh, is November of 2014. Uh, <clears throat> on the hearing, the five daughters hearing, we called repeatedly down at the White House, will you meet, please, Mr. President, with the five daughters who are Young ladies, one wrote a beautiful piano uh, song. She's a great piano player, pianist, uh, but she wrote a song to her dad. Um, and she just wanted to look the president in the eye and say, please advocate for our dad's release to the end of the torture. And after six months, we got back from the White House. He doesn't have the time. I yield to the I would like to add one more thing. 呃，当现在江天勇律师被中共绑架了，那么当时我记得奥巴马访问北京的时候，就是江天勇律师从凌晨两点钟一直等着要见奥巴马，等到上午九点被中共的特务抓走。呃，据说那个时候他发出了一个新闻稿，说在中国他很想见中国的人权人士，但是没有人权律师去跟他见面。结果这些律师呢，就凌晨两点起来，赶紧去要跟他见面，他就一直说没时间，没时间，没时间，最后。出了这样一个结果，在江天律永律师的这个事情发生，我在这提一下这个事情，之前也没有提过。呃、uh, ，as we mentioned, Mr. John Tianyong, the disappearing、uh, attorney, that it was him that who show up at two o'clock a.m. at the wee hours in Beijing during the president visit,、uh, because they learned that the pres、uh, the the president office release. I said, "Oh no, human rights show up during his visit," but that was not the case. So I want to emphasize that too. I would just add, Danielle was one of those five daughters, and and again, all we wanted was a face-to-face -face meeting,、um, so that the president could hear their appeals. Are you to my good friend? Thank you. Well, thank you to the chairman. I would suggest then we put in a formal request to President-elect Trump to make that meeting. Uh, from us as commissioners, I would certainly be glad to sign that, and uh, because uh, I think it's what we asked for, and I think maybe Yan、uh, Jinli brought up the idea of inconvenience, and I, I think sometimes the Chinese government feels like we will, we are not persistent, or we will lose our focus, or things that are inconvenient will put aside.、Um, I would suggest to them they haven't met Chairman Smith. Because he will not give up,、uh, he will be persistent, and I think that's what we need. And so I think that's exactly what we should do.、Um, and to each of you, I can't tell you it's a privilege to be here with you. And every time I come,、um, I'm inspired, I'm encouraged, and I realize that the fight goes on. And、uh, at times,、uh, thinking, you know, as a member of Congress, what can I do? And then I watch extraordinary people. In circumstances sometimes beyond imagination,、uh, rise up on those very issues that are our core foundation principles of human rights, and、uh, and that is truly inspiring. And it's from these hearings, and it's from each of you who've testified before. Some of us have become friends over the years.、Um, That told us you need to continue to talk, and I think we've spoken on this. And to let some of you know,、uh, last year we traveled、uh, to Hong Kong, to Tibet,、uh, and then met with Premier Li in the Forbidden City. 
And I can assure each of you, I, it was something I thought I'd never witnessed, sitting in the Forbidden City with the Premier of China and him answering questions about His Holiness the Dalai Lama, about him asking questions and answering questions about Falun Gong, about the Uyghurs, about freedom of religion in Hong Kong. And I can tell you this, that Ambassador Bacchus, along with uh, Leader Pelosi, myself, and other members of Congress, did meet with those dissidents in Beijing in the United States Embassy. Um, and it's a good thing we have divided government, because we have a voice. We continue to speak out on these issues. We continue to find common ground. So I can't tell you. Uh, the courage that you give me, the instruction you give me to continue talking, because many of us up here worry. Um, the inconvenience, or more importantly, uh, it's one thing for us to say what we're going to say and then go to our homes while your families are still in Chinese prisons, while your families are still under threat. Um, the, the feedback we've gotten from you is continue to make this issue. And I will uh, just ask or maybe make a statement, maybe rhetorical a little bit, uh, Wei Jing Sheng brought up this point about tying trade to human rights. And those of us in here know, going back to President Clinton, most favored nation status and some of the changes, um, I certainly was under the illusion that liberalizing trade and openness would have a significant impact on liberalization of personal freedoms. Uh, I have now seen that is not the case. And as I told someone, um, and again, it's anecdotal, but I can tell you this, I've been to Hong Kong dozens and dozens and dozens of times, uh, both going from Poson as a young teacher to Hong Kong and coming here. The last time I went, and certainly it was the first time as a, as a United States Congressman, Hong Kong is significantly different. Hong Kong feels different, and it feels different in one of those most basic ways of personal freedoms, religious freedoms, freedom of expression, and, and those should be concerns of ours. And, and I think going and I would say this, just as a suggestion, I'm not sure President-elect Trump would characterize it as a trade war, but I do think he should probably characterize it as a recalibration of fair trade. And, and I think as a nation, this is an important discussion we should have. Um, we may get cheaper products at our local big box store, uh, but it comes at a price. It comes at a price in workers, as Wei Jing Chung said. It comes at a price in uh, wages. It comes at a price in our economy. But it also comes at a price to human rights for those workers. It comes at a price that we've lost our leverage. And, and I would say this, I am very encouraged uh, that it appears that incoming Defense Secretary General Mattis has uh, impressed upon President-elect Trump that, uh, that torture is not something we do and it's not something that we accept from others. And, and I think this does give us a chance to reset. This does give us an opportunity because of a, a peaceful transition in government here to highlight those things. And, and I would I would say that each of you have said this. I think this commission can be a place for that to start again. And I think you've got a chairman that has been dogged about it. You've got a chairman that has been consistent across administrations. When they fail or fall short, he's called them out. When they've done something right or leading in that right direction, he's praised them for that. And I think I don't speak for all the commissioners, but I agree with that. And, and I, for one, am serious. I think we send a letter and ask the president-elect to meet with the five daughters, if that's what we're going to ask. Um, we should be prepared that that may not happen, too. And I think as a commission, uh, it may or it may not, but, but our responsibility is clear, and it comes from each of you saying this, we need to continue to press these issues. We need to continue to recalibrate how we do this. And uh, I think we underestimate the leverage of both buyer actions. This was a fascinating thing, and I never thought this would happen. Premier Lee was really fascinating because I told them I had been to Tibet before. And I said, I have been to Tibet in 1989. And they said, no, it was February of 1990. They're very good at remembering when I was there, <laughs> better than I. Um, and, and they said, hasn't it improved? And I said, well, it was easier than going by bus for seven days from Chengdu, because now we could fly in or take the train. Uh, there were more hospitals. There were more shops. But I told them candidly, speaking face to face, I said, it is very different. The culture is very different. And he said, well, you saw a village or whatever. Uh, yes, a Potemkin village that they showed us that was not there. But he brought up something very interesting that showed me that this relationship is changing a little bit. He says, Congressman, I know when you were a young man, you taught on the Pine Ridge Native American Reservation in South Dakota. How did America treat the Native Americans? And I answered to him, I wouldn't use us as an example of the right way to do it, because many of us know there's things we could do differently. We're asking you in the spirit of friendship, cooperation, human rights, to work with these issues and to understand all of us have to go through that. And it was fascinating to me that the Premier was gracious. He engaged in this conversation. I didn't 
have any expectations there would be a change, but I think it did show if we continue to bring these issues up, if we continue to lead with our values and tie those to our economic policies, not separate them from that, um, that there is potential here for us to get to a common ground. Uh, and I think for all of us, we have to continue to believe that because whether it's our father, uh, whether it's our relatives, whether it's our own family being asked to make horrific choices, um, we have to see a better day. So again, I thank each of you. I don't have a question of you, but I think it's important to, uh, to stress uh, the inspiration you bring to others, the courage that you bring to others, and, and, and to speak about an issue from the United States, I know doesn't take courage. To stand up and say it in Beijing or in Fosan or in Guangdong, uh, those take courage, understanding there will be repercussions. Um, but you, th this issue of basic human rights, it unites all of us. So uh, I thank the chairman once again for, uh, for putting together a remarkable panel. And uh, I do think it needs to be said, your persistence on the issue of human rights uh, is something incredibly admirable. It's something that every day, I'm glad you're still here because I do think, and the Chinese know this, they just want to wear you down over time. <laughs> they want to wear you down. I've seen it. Uh, they found the one person they're not going to wear down, so I'm glad to be with him. So I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank you for your leadership for decades on behalf of human rights in China. And I think uh, the idea that you suggested is a great one. We'll follow it up, and there'll be a letter from you and I, and of course the other, uh, the co-chair, and, and uh, I'm sure Marco will readily agree with that. Uh, is there anything else anybody would like to say before we conclude? Um, again, I want to. What's this? Okay, uh, for the record, uh, the unanimous consent that statements uh, from the 709 lawyers' wives, uh, lawyers' wives, I should say, be made a part of the record and by the Southern Mongolian Human Rights Information Center. Without objection, so ordered. And um, again, thank you that, uh, all for your insights. Uh, this is a new beginning. Mm -hmm. um, the failed policies on, uh, by any previous administration needs to need to matriculate into something that works, and you have given us the blueprint. Thank you so very much. The hearing is adjourned. Yeah, uh, if you could, you know, we do have the the photo of the empty chair from the um, uh, Nobel. Uh, Nobel Peace Prize when Leo Chabot was Ceremony. precluded from going. I would ask if for the witnesses and staff and, and Tim and I, and we all gather around and maybe get a picture uh, as a remembrance.